Hmm. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Are people still coming in? It's nice to see everyone today. I think we could probably get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 440 Gallery Artist Talk. Today, we're featuring Richard Barnett and his solo show, Ghosts of War, and also three artists in the project space with playful geometry. So we have Janet Peterson, Susan Greenstein, and Amy Weil. Um, this show is up through March 20th, so if you have a chance and you haven't done so yet, please stop by the gallery and see the work in person. It always makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm glad that you're here to see it uh, digitally online because uh, today we have the opportunity to ask the artists all kinds of questions. So I'm going to ask some specific questions. If you have questions, please either write them in the chat or save them until after I've asked my questions um, and we'll get to them at the end. Or if you just want to wait and unmute yourself at the end, we can do it that way also. Um, so today we're going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to start with the project space and then we're going to end with uh, Ghosts of War. So uh, let's take a look at the installation shots. Um, we're going to start with the installation shots from Playful Geometry. Thank you, Susan. Sure. So we'll start with Amy Weil. Let's take a look at Amy's work up, up close and personal. So Amy has three pieces, two smaller, and then a third that is quite large. So Amy, congratulations on a beautiful show. Thank you. Uh, as always, it's amazing to find the links between all the work in the project space. How does your work fit into this idea of playful geometry? Um, well, I think that my work is um, has always been rather geometric and rather playful. <laughs> so um, the, I think it was really, I was thinking about it with the painting that you just showed with the um, falling squares um that one feels uh very much about uh geometry of these squares sort of tumbling and and being very quite playful so they're they're kind of doing a little square dance um and there's a lot of lines that go through it so um so i was really thinking about pattern and color and how um these shapes could move and um sort of interact with each other in um in a way that that is playful um and there is a lot of movement but at the same time they're kind of cemented in there so um there's there's a bit of a juxtaposition between um them being very almost like fossilized into this space and kind of feeling like they're also floating Yes, uh, thank you. I noticed that, and um, and I'm very intrigued by the how they can have this sense of weightiness and then also feel light at the same time. Um, and uh, obviously, you're doing it intentionally. Does it? Um, and it's also kind of a paradox. So, can you just speak to the paradox? Like, what is it that you're communicating with that paradox? Um, I think I've always been interested in a kind of um, 
surface that felt like, you know, like when you walk down the street and you're looking at sidewalks and you see leaves that are sort of cemented that have been fossilized into the cement when it's wet. And I just, I love the patterns that you see and the different irregularities within these um, spaces. Um, so I like to play with that idea of um, something being very um, permanent and yet at the same time impermanent. You know, they're they're floating, they exist, um, they're they're definitely cemented in, but they also kind of dissolve in a way. Um, so I think it's maybe the idea of um, the permanence and impermanence, you know, it's like what these things, you know, like, um, like fossils, you know, they're dead, they existed at one time, and here they are, they still exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and fossils are fascinating. And, uh, and I like what you said about this, that you're not sure if they're coming or going, like if they're emerging, or if they're sinking into the surface. Yeah. And that's uh, intriguing to look at. Yeah, and I, I like to have this um, directness with my lines, with uh, creating um, movement with drawings and gesture. And, and so there's a feeling of being in the moment. I think I think a lot about time when I work so that the lines sort of represent this present moment of just gesture and just my hand is there in the same way that a fossil is also there. So it's like there's this weightiness of the paint. And then at the same time, there's, uh, you know, there's a history of, of the process. And then there's this very quick process. So there's like a slow and a quick going on. Oh, that's a good way to put it. That's fascinating. Um, so, Amy, I'm sad to report to this group here today that this is your final show with the, with the 440 Gallery um, as a member, sadly. I'm sad. Very sadly. And, um, uh, and, and uh, also, Susan, could we look at the other pieces too? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, I'm thinking about what's to come, but I'm also thinking about um, how is this work, is this work um, recent and is it a statement about, you know, sort of your current um, uh, personal state of affairs or is it uh, a comment on something larger? And, and where is it leading? If that's not too many questions in one. <laughs> Well, um, well uh, this, well, the piece that you just showed, I've been doing a lot of, these are all recent within this year, um, but the one that you just showed with the uh, rectangle within the rectangle, I've been playing a lot with the idea of remnants and um, creating um, a kind of, oops. Sorry. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, that one. So this this is actually um, a repurposed diary series where I, I was not happy with that particular piece um, where I was doing these, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with my diary series, but I did a lot of written text and, and words and phrases on these faux lined papers that I would paint into the um, uh, board. And so lately I've been doing these these pieces without words, because it just feels like I don't have any words for what's going on at the moment. It just all seems so horrific. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about things that um, are, you know, the idea of remnants or fragments of things, like focusing in on just things that are left behind. There's kind of fragility to those things that I'm sort of creating something kind of monumentalizing those small, humble little fragments of, of paint or texture. Um, so that's where I've been going lately. Amazing, um, thank you so much. Yeah. 
and I'm going to miss everybody. It's I'm I'm really want to say thank you to 440 and to all of you. It's been an honor being with you, and I'm going to be coming to all of your shows. So <laughs> I'll be there. And and we're still going to follow you, but you're going to be very missed. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and I think we are we have Susan Greenstein up next. So we're going to just take a pause for a moment. Let's stop the share. And um, OK, great. All right, we're all set. Karen, whenever you're ready, yeah. OK, there's, uh, can we do full screen? OK. It's not full, so, oh, OK, I see it is full screen. Sorry, is this not, is it not showing full screen? Uh, it's full screen to me, but not to you. Okay, uh, it looks good now, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. It, it might be my uh, window is not enlarged. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Um, so Susan, congratulations on your showing in Playful Geometry. When I look at this work, I see uh, and think about geometry. I see that it's kind of nothing but geometry, uh, yet your work is never rigid. Can you speak to your approach to geometry in general? Sure. Um, so when I start a painting, I think that's the first thing that I'm very attracted to. I'm looking for shapes that, um, um, you know, large shapes at first, but always geometric shapes. Those is, that's sort of what I'm searching for and how they connect to other shapes um, but it's never um, it's always sort of an approximate geometry um, it has you know it's it's um, it's not anything that's very rigid because i want to be able to sort of work into it and i want to be able to break the geometry when when i feel that that that's necessary <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I noticed with these works that they feel so familiar, like I feel like I might have been in these rooms before and and they have that, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, like they've been around for a while feeling, but then at the same time, they're so fresh. And um, if I try Try to unlock your secret. It has something to do with your direct method of painting and how carefully you observe and I'm gonna assume make choices. Um, what to you are the most important considerations when making a work that's satisfying to you? Hmm. Um, well, I think um, for me, it has to do with the kind of marks that I make and making sure that um, I think at the more that I work, the more I like to um, think about creating marks that um, will just be what they are and not going back and working into them, but really um, allowing each mark to, to be visible, to be um, what it was from the beginning. I mean, that's not to say that I don't layer things and add to them, but um, it's a, it's, the more I the the more I'm working this way, the more I'm developing, um, allowing each mark to kind of speak speak for itself, and um, and also the same thing about color. Um, I think that in the past I would I was more tentative maybe, and um, I'm I'm really um, enjoying uh, putting down intentional color that is as strong as I mean it mean it to be without as much layering as I used to do. Really beautiful. They just feel so um, organic. Thank you. Um, and uh, finally, when I look at these pieces, I see echoes of other artists. And um, I would rather not call it influence, but more homage. Um, whose work are you honoring when you're painting? 
Uh, well, there's always a lot of different artists that are sort of running through my mind when I'm working. Sometimes no artists at all, just kind of connecting to what I'm looking at. Um, but I do remember specifically in this piece, um, I was thinking a lot about um, Morandi, um, who is one of my favorite artists. And I was just thinking on the top, there are those three shapes. And um, I always think about the spaces between shapes. And that's something that um, I always look at his work um, to think about. Um, mm. And so I remember that sort of running through my mind when I was working, you know, just thinking about the spaces in between things and how they, how they relate to each other. And, um, and also I do remember at, um, I'm not sure if it was this painting or some of the other ones. Um, there's two artists that I remember thinking about. Um, Emile Nold is a you know, real favorite of mine. And I remember thinking about, um, his flower, his flower series, which, um, I, I don't think there's ever been a time that I looked at them and didn't just, um, look at them in awe. They just really, um, he does a, a watercolor series of flowers that, um, always knocks my socks off. And so it's something that I just think about in terms of the way he uses, uh, watercolor and lets colors flow into colors and, um, and the kind of shapes that he chooses. So that's something always in my mind. Um, and, and Prendergast also, I always think about Prendergast and the kinds of shapes that he has next to shapes, small marks, large marks. And, um, so that's sort of always in my mind when I'm working. Thank you. That, that's beautiful. I see that when you say it, but it's, um, completely through your own lens. So it's really wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Susan. Thank you very much. All right. And now, um, unfortunately, Janet couldn't be here today, but we've prepared a little treat for you. I met with Janet um, a few days ago, and um, we're going to let you hear from her directly. Welcome to our special edition of the Artist Talk. Uh, Janet Peterson whose work is in the project space in playful geometry. Uh, is not able to be here for the artist talk, but thank, thanks to the miracle of Zoom, she's going to talk to us now and you'll all get to hear. Congratulations, Janet, on a beautiful show, Playful Geometry. Thank you. And hi, everybody, virtually, hi. <laughs> um, so I have a few questions for you. Okay. Uh, first, I would love to hear about what your inspiration was for these pieces. Sure. So um, this is my second street series, which um, began in 2015. And um, these are um, their landscapes. Um, they veer towards imagination, but they are based on uh, images that I pulled from Google Street Map. And um, I uh, just, at a certain point, I wanted to see what my mother's house looked like on when, of her home growing up. Uh, and my son taught me that I could use Google Street Map. And so I started navigating up and down her block, which was Oak Street in Pasadena. And it dawned on me that I, you know, this was a way to look at, um, you know, um, a different landscape through a computer um, that I just, I wanted to, to see if I couldn't begin to explore um, the landscape and architectural landscape. And I, I further started to think that what if I came up with a series that were based on a particular street in America. And I, I figured out that, um, or I read that uh, Second Street happened to be the most named street in America, uh, you know, behind or in front of Main Street or first, even First Street. So that became sort of my parameter to work within. And um, I just, I don't know, I think I took about two weeks and just explored Google Street Map and came up with images that had something that I wanted to paint. Um, you know, they were not the best images. In fact, they were pretty um, gritty images and some of them, the lighting was really off and not even all that interesting. 
you know, pretty muted. And that just, um, I began to pull together a, a file of images to work from. And then from there, I, um, I, I worked either the lands, landscape or portrait format and, um, and uh, just played with the, mainly these are oil on paper and or acrylic gouache on paper and using different tools to work with and just truly freeing myself up and working out um, uh, a landscape that uh, I was playing with. And there are geometrical shapes in here. I'm using the, you know, the basic shapes, the square, triangle, uh, circle, and playing off that because I, you know, and within these four edges, I'm just composing these pieces. And they are very loosely based on the images that I pulled up. Um, and um, I think at a certain point, I will have those images to look at just to compare. And uh, so color becomes a little bit, a lot more imaginative, um, working in layers with, you know, writing underneath. And some of the writing is, you know, just the, there's like the plus and the minus on this. This is Stone, um, this is Stone Mountain, Georgia. But like in the upper left-hand corner, there, there's just some of the, you know, my mark making of what that Google street map had on its map, um, the, the plus and the minus, and uh, just really having fun and exploring and thinking about the landscape in a different way. I'm a plein air painter, so um, I, I love working directly and, you know, working on a landscape completely directly and trying to match the color and the shape. But so this just gave me license to free myself up, which is what I was interested in doing and working out the series in that way. Oh, so interesting. Um, so that brings me to my next question. Uh, in terms of technique, what are the commonalities that these have? Because I see um, this gives you a lot of freedom in some ways and some restriction also. Right. This one, this is St. Petersburg, um, Florida. It's, you can barely see it in this one, but I'm probably commonalities. I'm working out just very loosely with pencil. In some cases I'm working like blind drawing on the paper. So it's really just using imagination and just working out in my own mind how a landscape would look based on this Google street map uh, image. And, and then coming back to it with my own uh, sense of, um, I mean, coming back to the, you know, the paper and working with paint and figuring out, um, you know, what it would be like to actually stand there and paint on location. Um, so I would say that I am working in pencil to begin with. Most of these have pencil, whether you see it or, or not, this one is probably covered up quite a bit. And um, also working with um, these things. I don't know if you can see these, but I these are, <laughs> these are tools that I'm just like taking the paint. When oil, you can do that and just scraping it across the paper and then coming back in and painting it. Um, in this one, I started dripping paint just because that was the mistake, but I left that one in. And, uh, you know, working out a composition, I really like this one with the portrait and having to resolve the front part, you know, three quarters of the paper down and make it interesting, you know, because really it was just a bunch of pavement and empty space. But in that empty space, it's really fun. It's, that's the challenge is how can you make that, those shapes play off of what's, um, and not overpower what's going on in, in the background, which is, you know, the houses back, back there. So um, playing compositionally and, and guess, I guess ultimately, you know, giving these images a sense of place, which they, they really are out there. You just have to, click on the <laughs> or go there if you have the, uh, the money to get there and stuff. Oh, well, it's just such an interesting concept because um, so they have this similarity that they're all uh, Google Maps images. Yes. And um, then so you're using some of that inspiration of like the happens 
circumstance of things that are there. Yeah. And, and, and you're using the sense of place because they're all second streets. Mm -hmm. And so they have that in common, which could mean nothing else. Right. And um, then you're, you're bringing your own sort of selections of composition. And so can you talk about uh, how you develop the palette for these? How, was there any of it related to the Google image or is it is the um, palette your uh, imagination? Um, I would say perhaps a little of both. If I were strictly looking at the image and, and working with that palette, these would be probably pretty muted or even black and white. So it makes sense for me to, to really um, pull, pull out different colors that are probably not, I mean, that house wasn't blue. The house on the left was probably a white house. Um, the, the fence, uh, which is really loosely scraped back, wasn't really, I mean, that was probably a chain link fence. So I'm just, I'm just touching on what it would, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to pull the painting together as a whole. And, um, and so using my own prescription to do that, I mean, I'm kind of giving myself license to just make the mistakes, scrape out the, the, the paper, um, try making a big circle in the sky, that would be the sun, and working out shapes that just begin to play off each other and complement each other a little bit. And so, um, but don't lose sight of the fact that this is a street somewhere in America, and we are celebrating these houses or, you know, and, um, and I just love color. I mean, color is truly, that's what made these come alive for me. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that uh, house is a white house with a certain sense of light in that moment. Um, and I love, oh, love your imagined light as well. Yes, uh, guys. But I have one more um, closing question for you. Sure. Um, so I don't know how many second streets there are and how many houses there are on each second street, but it seems like you have a pretty wide variety of images to choose from. Yeah. How uh, do you imagine this series continuing? Um, it's, it could continue. I'm, um, I'm working out a, a different um, series right now. Well, first of all, I would love to continue working on second streets because, but I probably would continue and based on maybe the news in the morning, what is um, what is that newscaster you know talking about? Well, there's going to be a storm on in uh, you know a different part of Indiana, and what's the name of that town? And then I would probably research. Well, what's that Second Street doing in that town? In other words, it would have to be a way in to discovering. Well, what am I going to paint next? And truly doing that, don't. I mean, make that my challenge for to that day if I wanted to. So I, I want to continue this, and then I also uh, want to. Well, that's 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 sort of yeah. I would continue, but I probably would set up another challenge for myself somehow. And again, maybe that's a, the conversation I overheard in the coffee shop or something like for somebody talking about. Well, we just got back from, you know. Colorado <laughs> or something, and then kind of kind of figure it out that way, I would think. Oh, that's so interesting. Thank you so much, Shannon. Sure. Thanks for asking. Thanks. Come see the and, show. And yes, <laughs> see them in real life because you'll be wowed. <laughs> Maybe I'll paint your second street. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. So that was great hearing from Janet. And up next is Richard Barnett's solo show, Ghosts of War. Oh, one moment. A little technical difficulty. Um, yeah. So we'll get to see uh, installation views and then we'll ask Richard some questions. Can you see the screen? 
Can you see? That's great. Okay, great. All right. There's the man, Richard. So this one sculpture and the rest, I believe, are watercolor and ink. Is that right, Richard? Are you there, Richard? You might need to unmute. OK, can you hear me now OK? Yeah. OK, good. Um, your question was in, the, in the, the pieces on the wall, is there something else besides ink and watercolor, some pencil? Often, often what I do is start a drawing in pencil. And then what, once I get into what I'm, composition I'm going after, that's when I'll start inking it in because you, you, you can change the pencil drawing, but you can, really can't change the ink drawing. Right. And then uh, watercolor comes last. Uh, typically, not 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 always, because it, it, but typically it does. Yeah, that's that's really the staging of it: pencil to pen to watercolor. That's right. And maybe go back into it with a pen. Sometimes you have to because you you lose the drawing under the watercolor if you put on a lot of watercolor. Right. So congratulations on a beautiful show, Richard. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Karen. Thank you. Um, and there's so much happening in these lively, colorful watercolors and, and the sculpture. Um, but before we ask you any more questions, I would like you to have a chance to say how this show came to be. Well, the show came to be because it was the pieces were picked by uh, Amy uh, Williams, who's the director of the gallery, and Ellen Chews, who's uh, an artist in the gallery and also carries out a number of executive functions in the gallery because they, they picked the work um, after I returned from three weeks in hospital uh, for treatment of a very severe depression. And the first week was very useful. That was a, about the third week in November. Uh, so it was before Thanksgiving, I had lost about 40 pounds. Um, and uh, what that was about is that I suffer, and I suffer is really a good way to describe it, from cyclical severe depression. Um, since uh, 2012, when I've tried to have the depression treated, I've had four major bouts. The longest one went on for about 16 and a half months of depression. And, and uh, I even did things like continuing teaching. I needed it. I needed the income through the depression. But one of the things about the depression is that it basically takes away my will to create work. I don't want to work. I don't have, it doesn't, it doesn't come together for me. And depression has a lot of effects besides that you feel sad. It has an effect to slow down in some people, including me, your cognitive functions. And I've worked with two psychiatrists now on this with a psychiatrist who retired through most of it. And then starting about uh, two and a half years ago with Dr. Tim Stroop, who's terrific. They're both terrific. They're, they're excellent doctors. And I also have Parkinson's disease that was diagnosed in um, the, right at the beginning of 2020, I believe that the Parkinson's was diagnosed. Or maybe it was, yeah, it was 2020, yeah. So, is the depression concomitant with the uh, Parkinson's disease. I've asked my doctor who I see for Parkinson's, Dr. Sachdev about that. And what she said is probably, possibly, but there's no way of telling. But what I know is that the depression itself has actually gotten more severe that the first time that I had it, 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 it was lighter than it is than it has been this last time, which was three months. That was the time that I was hospitalized. And the best writing that I can recommend to you about depression is by William Styron called Darkness Visible. And Styron is a great American writer who wrote Sophie's Choice, which was made into the movie, wrote The Confessions of Nat Turner and plenty of other great stuff. And it's a beautiful piece of writing. And when I, it was sent to me by a, a cousin of mine who said, you got to read this. And I said, well, I don't, I'm still depressed. I don't really want to read anything while I'm depressed. This was like back in uh, December. Uh, and she sent it to me. And when I read it, I read, I've read it about three times. I lent it to my 
uh, physical therapist for the uh, Parkinson's disease. He's terrific too, Daniel. And he hasn't given it back to me yet. So I want it back from him. Uh, but it, 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 it's uncanny how close what Styron describes about his bout with depression, which lasted, I guess, for about a year and a half is to what I've experienced with it. And, and a problem with the whole damn thing is that, that if you, th th there's a sort of a divide between neurologic diseases and psychological diseases in a lot of people's minds. And if you have a psychological disease, whether it's a personality disorder, whether it's an obsession, obsessive compulsive disorder, you're a freak, you're a, 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 a bat out of hell, you're weird, you're junk, you're garbage. And that's really the way, to some degree, the way that I was treated when I was in the mental hospital, which is a very good place. Gracie Square is part of the Cornell Columbia network, but it was as close as I want to get to being in prison, to being degraded, basically, and treated as somebody who's wacko and weird. Um, and, well, Richard, and I, but I'm so sorry to hear that you've been going through all this. And um, how does it uh, relate to the work? Uh, well, yeah, I was going to say, I'm really happy that um, that we got to see this work because it's really amazing. And um, and I know when we talked briefly, you you touched on how it relates to the work. Do you want um, to that's, speak what, that's to that? what I that's what I want to get to. I just wanted to okay. give people a picture of, of, of what I've been through. Um, th what I've come around to is that what I'm looking for is to see darkness that I'll, I'll extend on, on the, the image of William Styron, that what I want to do is see the darkness in myself and in the world, that somehow, because I'm afflicted with a dark illness, uh, and I, I wouldn't describe it in any other way, what I want to do is see what is the structure, what are the contents of that darkness, to at least see what darkness is in other situations and for other people, to somehow try to come to grips with with what's going on in me, but also with what a lot of what's going on in the world, a lot of which people anesthetize themselves to. And, and hence your title, Ghosts of War, am I right? Absolutely, that's right. It, that finally became clear to me when I started thinking about how uh, there, I, I, it's in some ways I can't even, I can't even meet my own ghosts. I'd like to meet them. But, but they can be very difficult to meet. For sure, and I think um, you know it's human nature to avoid them. And, Absolutely. And also uh, to to paint things in black and white, which you certainly haven't done, um, which is really intriguing to me that um, your subject matter and your titles um, uh, is very dark, but your your images and the way that you treat them is very light and playful. Um, what do you make of that? Well, what I make of it is that, that I have, and I expect that we all have many different components in my personality. Something as setting, settings is jumping up here, let me uh, uh, rid of it. That, 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 uh, that I think all of us have more in our personalities than we're ever going to be fully conscious of. And some of this comes from having a nephew who I've watched go through college and high, uh, go through high school and college and medical school and psychiatric training. He was now a psychiatrist. He's practicing, practicing psychiatry in um, Connecticut and teaching. And I, 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 and I love talking with him about, uh, about some of this. And most of us were constructed in a way that there are going to be parts of ourselves that we don't know well. That's just the way we're put together. We couldn't live if we knew all about ourselves because we've got to have an unconscious. A lot of things have to be unconscious in order that we can function in the real world. You have to step out of the way when you hear the car coming. And, and that means you have to have a clear head. You can't be going on and on about what's going on in your emotions when you're walking through traffic, you'll get killed. And so, so we're, we're made to hide certain parts of ourselves within ourselves and from other people. But they're always going to come out. I, I can comment on this, how, how, what this is about. If you go back to that piece that was just there a minute ago, uh, the, the one right before this, that's it. That's the one. That's the one that's called There Was No Slavery in America. And I think it's about 18 by 24. I'm not sure it's a watercolor. 
And what, what often what happens for me is I'll get into something and I'll start it. I'll, I'll start making it. And I don't start out with a title or an idea of where it's going to go. I just sort of have a, an impulse, if you like, to, to start something. And with this, what I got into was making two things that are alike and yet they're not alike. And when I've thought about it consciously, what I've said is that this reflects a very common way that uh, that people appre that we really apprehend situations. And what it is, we apprehend situations, we, we, we understand them in terms of the ambiguities that are within them. But if we're gonna take a stand on something, we may have to take a, side of, a stand on one side of the ambiguity or another. And ambiguity literally means that there's more than one uh, factor at play in a situation. And for me, it's that the history of America is so clearly the history of a slave nation. For most of our history, we had slavery. Uh, we haven't, if you factor in uh, the, the, the uh, horror that was made of reconstruction, uh, if you factor in Jim Crow lynchings, if you factor in that the Tulsa race massacre, which is an ex-student of mine who's black pointed out to me was one of many race massacres. If you factor that in, we're a butcher shop. That's our history. Our history is really, it's a great history, a wonderful history with a lot of beautiful things in it, but it's also a history of a butcher shop. What, what we did to millions and millions of people who we knew damn well, speaking as a white man, we knew damn well that they were people. That was never in doubt. We knew they were human beings. We knew they were like us. So we created this whole goddamn setup that the South went to war for, that they were somehow different, that they could be property, that you could buy them, sell them, have them from birth till death, make them work for you, rape all the women, kill the men if you wanted to, come up with an excuse and kill anybody you wanted to, and that this was fair and this was Christian. Save me from that. It's a horror. It, it's it like totally, a horror. It, it absolutely is. And um, Richard, I admire your, um, your willingness to grapple with hard topics. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could talk about the Bobby Yar memorial piece. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I just hope it's clear with this though, that, that what, what it's really about is ambiguity, that, that you can look at one or the other and you can say, are they different? Are they the same? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, the, 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 the Bobby Yar piece, I think, you probably have to keep going. The Babby Yar piece is a pretty big piece. I think it's about, oh, what is it? About 22 by 28 or something like that. And when I did it back in the 1990s, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I simply made it up, went with it, used a lot of red ink, which you can see there. That's the, that red is really the sepia ink. If you, if you look, say, like at places, like maybe in the upper right, where you have... Um, uh, you can see the ink. When the ink gets hit with water, with watercolor, it, it dissolves again somewhat, and you get these uh, red splotches. You get all these red splotches, okay? And there's obviously other things in this, like a part of a figure with a leg and a knee and a foot, and maybe some kind of a snapping fish or creature at the bottom. I mean, if you go through it, I think you can, you can certainly imagine somehow that, that there are references and there, there are some that I'm aware of and probably others that I'm not aware of. But when I made it, I just made it as a piece. And then um, William Holman, who runs, who ran William Holman gather, uh, Gallery, which was down on the Lower East Side, uh, met me and he liked my drawings. Uh, and uh, he gave me a show, first in a group show and then a one person show of my drawings. And I said, well, I wanna have some sculptures in it. So we put sculptures in it too. That was back, I think, in 2014. I think that was, it might have been 2013. It was either the end of 2013 or the beginning of 2014. And I was actually depressed at that time. It was, it was very difficult to get through the whole thing. And it was, I was, uh, and I, I made, a, made a number of mistakes in talking with people, which is just like what happened with Styron, where I really put my foot in it with what I said to somebody when all I would have had to say was great to see you and let's get together later. I didn't have to go into anything else, you know, but I, but I did. And there were a couple of people where I really offended them. Uh, and uh, anyhow, but anyhow, I got through it uh, thinking, you know, I'm dressed wrong for the opening and everything else. 
instead of being able to, to enjoy it. Uh, but so, th so this was, was a piece that was in that show. And I think at that time it was sort of like untitled or something like that. It didn't really have a title. And it was later when I opened it up, when we were looking, uh, when um, uh, Karen and, um, excuse me, um, uh, Ellen Amy and, and yeah. Amy and Ellen were looking for work to put together a show because I couldn't just, I couldn't grapple when I was depressed with organizing a show. I had work, I had done work and I'd had work framed, but I didn't know how it came together in a show, okay? So this was a piece that they picked and it stayed in. There, there was one or two pieces I think that they picked that we kicked out in favor of more recent pieces, but this was a piece that they got. And when I looked at it, I said, you know, I can call this Memorial to Babi Yar because I've gotten very interested in um, the, the music that uh, Shostakovich wrote. I love Shostakovich, the composer. It, to, me, to me, he's a 20th century Johann Sebastian Bach. And it's, it not, it's interesting that he admired Bach a great deal. Uh, and Shostakovich was always in and out of trouble with the Communist Party. He, he, was, he lived through the years of the Russian Revolution and Stalin and the Second World War. He lived through some of the darkest times, but he, he wrote tons of music, including music for Russian films that, that is wonderful stuff to work with. To him, it was a way to make a buck, but I, I love his music. And uh, particularly a piece that I'd recommend to anybody is the 24 Preludes and Fugues which of course is, is related to Bach's 48 Preludes and Fugues. Listen to them. The thing is just it's haunting and magnificent. But the 13th, Shostakovich wrote 15 symphonies and 15 um, string quartets. And if you wanna look at, at, at the darkness that he saw in Russia, listen to quartet number eight. It's the quartet with the repeated knocking on the door of the secret police of the KGB. But in the symphony, Babi Yar, what he did was he took some poetry that Shostak, that Yevtushenko wrote after the Soviet Russian poet, after Stalin had died, that's a, a poem about Babi Yar, which was a ravine in Kiev, in Ukraine. And it was a place where in 1941, the Nazis shot over 33,000 Jews. They shot a lot of other people there too. Ukrainian militia did some of the killing. I don't know if they did it in the beginning, but the Nazis had a lot of allies. The Germans had allies all over the place. People who wanted to kill Jews and kill somebody. If they wanted to kill somebody, then you join up with the Nazis, join with the Germans, right? So anyhow, the, Babi Yar in 1950, the, the poem starts out that, that, he, that he has set, that, that he has sung by a, a bass in the opera. There is no monument at Babi Yar. And, the, and this place is where the Germans executed thousands and thousands of people. And, and a reason was that so many of them were Jews and there was so much anti-Semitism in the Soviet government, which at that time was the government of Ukraine. But, uh, but uh, Shostakovich went further. One of the things that he, he set some other lines in that poem uh, to music, but he also set to music some of Anne Frank's writings. And, it's, it's something where you can listen to it and weep. And, and it's, a, it's a crossing of dreadful events and great art. And, and, to, me it was, and to me, it suggested that, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not Shostakovich, nothing like that, but I can take things that are dark and try to use them in art. And, and I can say that this here is my memorial to Babi Yar. And interestingly, Babi Yar was shelled by the Soviets. They blew the hell out of it in this damned invasion that they have, which is just a replay of Hitler's invasions in the Second World War. Don't make a mistake about it. Putin is the new Hitler. He's certainly the new Stalin. And anybody who doesn't un understand that is just a fool, okay? But, and nobody well, knows what to do about it. But, but that's yeah. what this is about. It's a, it's a memorial to the people who were killed at Babi Yar. That's all it's about. That's that's beautiful, Richard. Um, what's fascinating to me is that you um, you're you're dealing well that that it's coming full circle, and you're dealing with like really difficult parts of human nature. I almost feel like um, these are like portraits of your subconscious. I think they um, are. <laughs> and then at the same time, um, 
they're very life affirming. They're, they're very, there's some, uh, some real liveliness and um, uh, energy in them. Um, Thank you. And, and what I wanted to, uh, uh, for a final question is um, this one sculpture in the show, Susan, if you could go back to the image of the sculpture. Um, and, and I, uh, I also feel that in your sculpture, and I want, and and this sculpture is different than other pieces of sculpture I've seen of yours. Um, yes, that's right. And, and um, I wonder if you like how this relates to how you um, construct your drawings. They, it feels very related to me. Well, I guess shapes, spaces, and lines and hatch lines. I mean, it, I I believe it is very related. I, I believe it is. I made quite a few welded sculptures in the. Uh, 60s and 70s and 80s. I made this in 1983. I did. I did the welding. I I, I had a license. I should renew it. Uh, a, a welding permit. I can weld in my loft in Soho, and I, I did. I welded a number of pieces, and I welded this literally out of welding rod, quarter inch and eighth inch welding rod. Um, but I think it's the same. It's. I think it's very similar because it's really uh, to me about its own design. Which which I like. It doesn't to me to me it doesn't have any dark uh, subtext to it except maybe the title, which is Black Spring. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. So the only thing is the title. Uh, and um, yeah, and again, it feels very organic and lively and life affirming. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Richard. You're um, most I welcome. Wanna... I want to open the questions to the group. I know that there was uh, a question in the chat. Let me see. Um, where'd it go? I can read it if you want. Would, would you please, Kay? Thank you. Yeah, it's um from Alan Brafman, can, oh, I'm sorry, and it's to oh, Andy is. about the descending dancing squares piece. Can you say something about the implication of the lines and the swirl at the middle right of the frame? Is Amy, yeah. Oh, you're muted, Amy, sorry. Okay, there. Thanks, Kay. Um, yeah, the, the, um, it's really, it was just a very intuitive, fast drawing. Um, so I let my hand pretty much create um, that gesture without thinking about it. So there really isn't anything beyond those, it, it, you know, I wanted it to, I think I, I think about placement and the formality of, of where things are placed, but with those quick drawings, they're, they're just like, um, like if you did um, figure drawing, um, what are they called? Those very fast sketches, corks, quirkies or something. Um, so that's basically what it was about. Um, that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ellen. Well, Amy, I'm really struck by that large piece of yours, which I know you're very much into the grid. But to me, it just feels like that grid just wants to break itself up. And that's what those squares are doing. They are breaking up your grid, whether you like it or not. And it just has so much energy. And I feel like there's another piece in the show that also is sort of break, is breaking out of the grid. And I wonder if this is, uh, Karen alluded to it, but or actually said it, but you know, there's a lot of change going on in your life right now. And it seems like this is almost like a, a manifestation of it. It's like breaking out of the constraints. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank a you. It's not a question, <laughs> but um, I'm, it's very exciting. It's very, very exciting. Um, I know it means you're leaving the gallery, which I don't like, but, um, but I love the work and um, I mean, it's very exciting. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to say something about um, your work, Susan. Um, I loved what you said about the mark making and how you don't 
that the mark that the paint that you put on you just leave it and i was looking i was noticing that it's it's become very abstract i i love that i love that you you take these paint marks and you let them be i i think it's really um fresh and beautiful thank you very much thank you that's something that i'm you know it's it's been a long time coming but i'm i'm working at getting getting um, closer to really some, I think one of the beauties of watercolor is just letting it be as much as possible. So I'm kind of moving towards that. Yeah. Thanks for noticing that. Questions, comments, Ellen? Well, again, it's, it's a con Comment, but um, Janet talked about, you know, changing the color and, and it's like, that's, you're right. I mean, the wonderful thing about being an artist, I mean, at least on your paper or canvas, you say, I'm an artist, I can do whatever I want, you know, <laughs> whether or not it works or whether or not people feel good about it, that's not really the issue. But, you know, you, nobody is stuck with, I mean, her color is so gorgeous. And I'm so certain that there's no second street in the world that looks as beautiful mm -hmm. as Janet's paintings. Um, and they also, uh, that one that has such an, a long, it's the portrait uh, view um, that it, it just has, it feels so deep in corn to me in a way, you know, this kind of like she's, she's, um, you know, she's channeling her California roots with that, those greens and pinks and that long geometric. I, I just think they're really very beautiful, but um, I, you know, nobody has to. And, and Susan, I don't know. I mean, do you, I'm sure you make up the colors where you want to. <laughs> I definitely I hope. Yes. Good, okay. I'm gonna mute. Um, I just wanted to ask one, question to Amy. Um, you, um, were, you were talking about your diary series. And I'm wondering, <clears throat> is how long have you been working on that? And where do you see that headed? Um, the diary series? Um, I, about, um, it started um, during the pandemic. And, and mostly it was when um, Trump was still in power. And it was just like my outrage during that period. Um, so I don't know if it's going to actually continue. Um, because like I said, you know, I don't want to create things that it has to come very organically, these pieces. And so far, there are no words at the moment. Um, but they, they will probably come up again, um, you know, uh, alongside the Remnant series. Thank you. Okay, uh, Frida, go ahead. Um, I wish uh, it's sort of for Janet, um, but also for Susan. Uh, but I sort of wish Janet was there. Is that I also am a and plain air painter, um, and uh, admire um, the instant beautiful marks that Susan makes. And I was just so inspired by Janet taking the end plane there concept and somehow making it into something that she doesn't have to be there for, which is because of COVID and weather, you know, something and plain air painters struggle with, like, you know, you end up painting outside your window. And I love what she did with it and really inspired me. I, you know, I wish I could tell her that if anybody sees her, you could tell her that it made me feel like, oh my God, you know, like I, you could, that she took it to that level was really cool for me and made me think and makes me want to try something, um, not copy her, but it just, just opened up ideas like that you can be on second street. I love that, you know, the weather, all of that was really cool. I just, someone can tell her I thought that that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. I will. That's yeah. just brilliant. Yeah, br really brilliant. Brilliant idea. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your work. It's really fun to see. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
You wanted to speak again, Ellen? Go for uh, it. Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> just, I mean, these the shows are beautiful, and Richard's work is just wonderful to see in the gallery. Thank you. And you must come and just see the freshness, the beauty of it, the drawing and the sculpture, which is, you know, drawing, drawing in three dimensions. So just so perfect. When we went to the studio, it was kind of a singular piece of sculpture. And both Amy and I had the same idea. And she said it to me and I said, oh my God, that's exactly what I, I thought. This will fit beautifully with this show. So, uh, you know, in real life is always better than on the screen. And I hope you, especially now that the weather is getting a little warmer and, um, you know, life is, dare I say, no, I won't dare say, but um, life continues and that we can go, we can go and see things um, in person. It's really beautiful. So. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. You're welcome. Yeah, your sculpture in the window with the shadows, casting the shadows is gorgeous. Oh, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Um, about those shadows, because I am so attracted to those shadows. Did you, when you created the piece, did you consider those shadows? I mean, was that no. part of the, it just, it just no, has that. No, because, because the shadows, depending upon what kind of lighting you have, <coughs> the shadows are going to change unconsciously, possibly. I mean, so, something that I, to try to answer that, something that I said to a psychiatrist, to the one psychiatrist that, I, that I'm seeing now, is I said, my sense is that, it, that an awful lot of, of designing and anything that we design, whether it's cl classes that we teach or work that we make or is, is carried out unconsciously, that we don't have in our mind, the, the, have in our minds the, all the ifs, ands, and buts, sure. but in a way they're there, we're taking them into account. So sure, I mean, the, the, in, from that sense, yeah, I mean, the, sh the, the, uh, the shadows, uh, change, you know, depends on the lighting, but they're certainly part of what a uh, part of the piece too. Well, they're beautiful the way they are right now. They really. Well, thank you. I'll have to come out and see them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd like to point out too for for a, anybody who's uh, listening to this talk that all the work that you've seen today is for sale. Mm. If you Fine. get my drift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. And, and you don't have to come to the gallery, it's for sale uh, through Artsy. If you um, just go to the Artsy website, 440 Gallery, you'll be able to find our pieces. You can also just call the gallery on, on uh, Saturday or Sunday and speak to Amy and um, you don't even have to go through Artsy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, well, if there's no more questions, I just want to say thank you to Richard for um, being so courageous to put a show together when you really weren't feeling well. And thank that you. the result is very beautiful. And, um, and I also want to let everyone know that coming up next, we have Joy Mackin's solo show around town. That's going to be up from March 23rd to April 24th. Um, and please come to the opening on March 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. And it, also in the project space, contemplations with myself, David Stock, and Lee Blanchard. So something to look forward to. So thanks, everyone. Have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Good Thank to see you everybody. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.